Hello, my name is Vinnie Kildoff and I'm here today to teach you about the Irish Tin Whistle. And for the next while, I'm going to teach you some techniques, I'm going to teach you some tunes, and we're going to hear some live music as well. But first of all, I'm going to show you some tin whistles. I've got a D whistle, which is um, probably the most common instrument in Irish traditional music because uh, most people play in the key of D, or what we know as, as concert pitch. Here I have probably a sample of the penny whistle, which is a, it's a Clark's whistle. And uh, this is probably one of the oldest instruments in the world. It's been around a long, long time, long before I was born, or my father, or my grandfather. And here I have um, what we, what's known as a low whistle, which is a very, very mellow instrument and is m used to play probably slow airs more than anything else. And uh, I have other keys, like a tiny little whistle here. It's an F whistle, which is very, very suitable for kids because of the size of their fingers or whatever. And um, it's one I would recommend for children, I think, more than anything else because it's, uh, it's, because it's small and it suits their fingers and it, it helps them to cover the notes where with these whistles, they actually, the, the, the stretch is very, is very wide, and this one actually helps them an awful lot better. Now, I've got two tin whistles here, and they are made by Waltons. Uh, they're recognisable with the green top and the brass bottom, and they're made here in Ireland by Waltons. Now, you're probably wondering why there are tape here on the whistles and stuff. You can, on both whistles, I have, I have my, my B here on the D whistle actually flattened with a piece of tape. It's a tuning. It's for tuning because a lot of these whistles are mass produced and uh, the machines seem to go out an awful lot and leave you with whistles that are out of tune. So if that happens, I actually flatten the notes by using tape over the notes on the top end of the note as opposed to the bottom end. And to sharpen them, sometimes I actually bore them out a bit more to, you know, for, for the actual tuning. Also, um, there are various different types of tops, some which are much easier blown and, and easier to use. And sometimes I might take two different whistles made by two different companies and use a barrel, actually, from one company and uh, a mouthpiece from another. And sometimes I might actually mess with the fibble or the mouthpiece here. It's the, it's the, the, the part of the mouthpiece that actually makes the sound. It's the whistle end, and uh, I may mess with that for tone as well. But uh, we won't go into that. We may go into that later. In fact, my father was very, very good at this. And I have a whistle here, which he got in, in England, which is made by generation. And I think he got this long before I was born. And uh, because he was so good at messing with the mouthpiece here, or the fibble, um, one day I played this whistle after he had worked with it. And I liked it so much that I asked him for it, and he gave it to me. And I have never touched it since, but it is probably the most beautiful whistle I've played. But he was very, very good at this, and uh, still is, actually. So this is a, a very, very old sea whistle, which uh, I treasure, and uh, it's one of the things I'd be always afraid to lose. Uh, it's probably the best whist whistle I have in my collection. Now, whistles are made in um, a few different kinds of materials. They're made in brass, nickel, tin, wood, aluminium. They're made, sometimes they're made from plastic. I would not recommend a plastic whistle for anybody. But uh, first of all, we just go for to brass and nickel. And probably the difference between the tone of this is a brass whistle, obviously, and this is nickel. And the difference between the tone here is that the nickel would be probably more shrill, where I think the brass is more warm. But uh, I find, like playing live, when you're actually playing on the you know on stage with lights and stuff, that the brass is much more. Um, uh, sensitive to, to heat and cold. So in a hot situation, it would go sharp, and in a cold situation, it would go flat. Whereas the nickel would probably hold its tuning better because I think it reflects the heat back off it. That's one thing I do know. But uh, that's just one thing about tuning, and that's the difference between a brass and a nickel. Now I've got uh, this Clark's whistle here, which has got a very old style breathy tone. Again, it's, it's the model, as I said, from the, the old penny whistle which has been around uh, longer than Moses. But uh, I'll just give you a, 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 a sample of what it sounds like.
that is the old Clark's whistle, which, uh, as you can see, has got a really warm, um, breathy kind of a sound. I particularly like that one. Now, there are lo lots of um, points I'd like to make here. Now, most parents tend to buy a D whistle when for, for their children, and that's um, that I can understand that because D is probably the most common key uh, Irish traditional music anyway would be would would be played in. So naturally, the, and also some music teachers. But uh, what I would recommend for a kid, because what happens is that that kids' fingers are a lot smaller than ours, and they do not, they they're not able to cover the the notes or the holes. Which, which can result in like a funny sound or not, not actually, the notes are not covered properly, so you will not get a good, it can sound like or like that, very much like that. So I would recommend, for a very young kid, I would recommend a G whistle, which is a very small little whistle for kids' fingers, or an F whistle as they, as they get older. And again, there's an one between this and a D, which is a, an E flat whistle. And uh, you could actually, traditional musicians use E flat whistles a lot because they're very bright. They sound very bright, and they, they're, especially when musicians are playing in sessions, they can hear themselves. Uh, whereas a D whistle is probably a bit more mellow. Now, one more thing is there's a thing called a low whistle, which I think I showed you before. and this, for adults, is like the D whistle is for kids, and the fact that if I've got to play this, I've got to spend a few days, if I haven't played it for a while, just to, to cover the holes again, because it's so big. And I definitely wouldn't recommend this for your four-year-old kid, because it's uh, extremely difficult to cover. So that's the low whistle. And this particular one is in the key of D. And they can be got in E, F, G, A, E, and various keys, whatever key you need. So that's the low whistle. The next thing I'm going to teach you is something we all have got to do, and that's to learn how to play. So uh, I'm going to start by using a D whistle, because as I said, it's, it's the most common key that people play music in. And on this D whistle, you can play in like maybe five different keys. You can play in D, you can play in G, you can play in A, you can play in A minor, you can play in E minor. And you can play tunes in other keys as well, but the, the, those keys suit the D whistle actually better than, than, than anything else. Now, as I said, I'm going to teach you the scale on the D whistle here, and I would not recommend, as I said, for, as again, for young kids to use this particular whistle, because you can use the D scale to play either an F or a small G whistle. You can use the scale of the D whistle so that when you get to the D whistle, you understand the scale. If you want to go more advanced, you can actually learn the scale of the F whistle. For the moment, we're going to show you the scale of the D whistle. And the whistle is held like this. You've got your three fingers on the bottom there, and these three fingers on the top. So we'll start with the scale. At the back, you've got your, your, your thumbs like that. And we start with the scale, and the, 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 the first note is D, with all fingers down. Second note is E. Third note is F sharp. Next note is G. Next is A. Next is B. Next is C sharp. And the last one is D again which is played, how that is done, how the note sounds like it's, it's in the next octave is because I'm blowing harder, so it would be the two difference with the two Ds would be. And sometimes it can be good to use this finger for your high D as the, it makes the note sound much more clear. Another thing is that uh, you can blow the whistle very straight or you can use a method which is called tonguing, which is using your tongue to get more distinction from the notes. And you'll find that this is really good as you go on, because tonguing becomes part of the tunes and the melodies and emphasis and phrasing. So I'll show you the difference between uh, actually playing the notes normally and using your tongue. And that is without using your tongue. And if you were to use your tongue, it would sound like this.
Now, that is the scale played with, with your tongue, using your tongue to actually get emphasis on the notes, and it makes them very, very clear. And one thing I'll say before I go any further is that to blow the whistle, you don't have to blow that hard. Because if you do, that's what happens. If you don't, that's what happens. And one of the hardest notes for children to actually get on the whistle is the bottom D, because again, as I mentioned earlier on, they're unable to cover all the notes. So in that case, they can use the little F here, F whistle, which they will find much, much easier to, to um, get the bottom notes and much easier to cover all the notes. So now the next step is we're going to go on to uh, learning a tune. And probably the, the most common tune, or the tune that everybody teaches first, is a tune called The Dawning of the Day. I think we've all learned to go to school, and it's also known as Fáni Galan Lé, Oscar Elge. And what I'm going to do now is I'm going to give you the notes to that tune, and uh, I'm going to play it for you first. I think it's time again to hear that slow air with some accompaniment. that was that little simple tune with the band. Now, don't worry, that sounded lovely because we had uh, backing there and I've been playing the whistle for quite a long time, the best part of probably 25 years. So I would not worry about, um, about how good that sounded because one thing I have to say to you, from once you learn, and even that simple tune, the key to being a good player or learning is practice. Now we're going to move on a bit. And uh, I've got a book here, which there are lots of simple tunes in it. Um, there's hornpipes, jigs, reels. And uh, this was, was produced by Mr. Pat Conway, actually, who's, who's inside looking at me here at the moment. That's the book of tunes. And we're going to now go on to a, a, a tune called The Boys of the Blue Hill, which is one of the very first hornpipes I learned. And I'm going to teach you this tune with the very basic notes again before we go on to anything else. And uh, I'm going to play it really, really slow.
and that was the boys of the Blue Hill. Now, at that time, you heard me use the second octave, which I didn't actually talk to you about earlier, which is, means that you just have got to blow harder, and you'll know when you're on the octave, you'll feel it. It takes more um, breathing, more, more power to, to actually get the, the second octave. And also, I used the tonguing all over that, that uh, tune there as well, which you, you probably heard. Now, I'm going to move on to ornamentation. And one of the most basic ornamentation uh, I, I can teach you on the whistle is things called a treble. And a treble is, I'll take you through the scale and show you what a treble is on each note. So we'll start with the with D. Now, I'm going to do those again for you so you can see exactly what I'm doing in much slower. So for a D treble, we're going to use this E note here. For an E treble, we're going to use our F sharp. For an F sharp, we're going to use our G finger. For a G, we're going to use our A finger. For our A, we're going to use our B finger. For a B, we're going to use our C sharp finger. And on this one, it's literally impossible to do one, so you don't do one, and you're back on your high D again. Now, these help you to embellish the tunes, and they it, they help you to, to ornamentate the melodies as, as you go on. And what I'm going to do for you now is I'm going to play you the Boys of the Blue Hill again, that last tune, using these trebles. And that was the Boys of the Blue Hill with trebles. Now I think it's time again to hear that with the band. <laughs> And that was the Boys of the Blue Hill with the band. And that sound might have sounded very good, but someday, with practice, you're going to be able to do that too. Now, next thing I want to show you is that that particular tune is in the second edition of the Sudlum's book on page four, which I'm going to show you here. It's on page four here. And it's well diagrammed, and the, the, the actual notes of the whistle are underneath the staff on the way the tune is written. So it's, it's very, very good for children to uh, get this book, actually, I recommend it. Now, the next thing we're going to go, go on to here is I'm going to play the, ch the, the scale, because I used the high octave that time in The Boys of the Blue Hill. I'm now going to do the second octave 
in the scale of D for you. And I may put a treble in here or there, just as a sample. And that was the both octaves in D, and you need to know those for, for the boys of the Blue Hill. Actually, I put a third octave D there, which is quite difficult to get, unless for a while I would not recommend it for kids, or they may take your heads off if you're listening to them practicing. So I would not recommend that third octave D for a while. And now you can see why I would not recommend that high note for a while for kids. And the next thing I would like to go on to here is rhythms. And first of all, we've got the rhythm of a march in the dawning of the day, and we've got the rhythm of a hornpipe in the boys of the Blue Hill. And this time I'd like to go on to a jig, the rhythm of a jig, which is in 6-8. And you'll notice the difference between this style and the boys of the Blue Hill. And rhythm in Irish traditional music is very, very important. <clears throat> so much so that Irish traditional musicians tap their feet a lot. Sometimes adjudicators and flag hills and stuff don't like it. But I, I highly recommend it because I think it builds, it inbuilds rhythm into kids from a very, very young age, and I would encourage it. At this time, we're going to go on to the rhythm of a jig. And also, I'm going to teach you another um, a trick on the whistle, which is, uh, again, is ornamentation, and it's, it's rolls. And rolls are very important because in reels and jigs, they really create uh, the melody of the rhythm. They make the rhythm very graceful and they help also the, ri you know, the rhythm of the tune. So what I'm going to show you is the rolls on each note of the scale of G because this time we're going to the scale of G. Now before I actually show you the rolls, I'm going to play you the scale of G and I'm going to tell you what each note is. So we're starting with G, which is the three bottom holes with your fingers off. And here we go. It's G, A, B, C natural, D, E, F sharp, and high G. And that is the scale of G. Now this time I'm going to show you how to do a roll. And I think the easiest roll to do on the whistle is a roll in G. And how this is done is, it's what you've already learned in a treble, which is this guy. And to finish off the roll, you use this finger to beat off your G note. And G is actually the easiest key to do a roll in. Now, a roll, when completed, is a treble first, and then the beating of your finger off the G note. So it sounds like this. Now that can be done on each note. So what I'm going to do this time is I'm going to do a scale with rolls included. That's all you need to know for this next tune, which is in the key of G, and it's a jig. So I'm going to play this tune very slowly with the rolls um, included.
and they were rolled. Now, included there were also some tonguing notes and some trebles I used earlier on. So when you, if you want to listen to that again, you'll hear where I used them. And the next thing I would like to go on to is that the root note of the roll, um, different people use different fingers as the root note of the roll because sometimes they highlight the beginning of it. That's your, your first bit. So what I'm going to do now is give you a choice because sometimes different people play in different styles, different people pick up on different things. And sometimes when you're playing a high part of a tune, using these, this finger as the root note for a G roll is very effective. So you can, I can use any of these three fingers as the root note. And I'm just going to show you a sample of those now. And you can hear the actual pop is much sharper of these two top fingers. So that if, that if I put that back into the jig again, it would sound something like this. And that is a sample of how you can use different root notes uh, for that particular tune. Now I think it's time again to hear that tune with the band. <laughs> Wow, feels good to play with the band. And that was the jig I taught you a while ago, played with the band. Now I'm going to move on to the most commonly played Irish tunes, which are reels. And they're in 4-4, four, four, the rhythm of 4-4. Four, four. And they are very commonly played in sessions, more than any other, like jigs, hornpipes, or whatever. These are more commonly played. So I'm going to teach you the very first tune that my father taught me. And I think it's a very, very good tune for kids to learn, because it's simple. And it's in the key of G. So here we go. I'm also going to incorporate uh, rolls, breath notes, and trebles into this tune as well. Now, I'm going to play those, that tune for you again. I'm going to play you the A part, the first part, and the B part separately, just to show you the difference between each part. So here we go. That was the first, that was the A part of the tune, first part of the tune. Now I'm going to play you the B part.
and that was the B part of the tune. And I hope you noted there the way I used the rolls in the tune to actually make it more melodic. And you, you, as you, you practice and as you can play the tune faster, you will notice how, that, how the rolls will help you. Now there's one more thing I would like to say is that, is talk about breath control, which is um, how to incorporate your breathing into the rhythm of a tune. And being human, we all run out of wind. So um, it, it, breath control is done on timing. And everybody probably uses different kinds of breath control. But I will give you one sample of how to use your breathing. And you can incorporate your breathing into the rhythm of the tune. So I'm going to try and show you a sample of how breathing is used. And if you look at that piece I've just played there enough, you will see that I've used that breathing, my breathing in the exact same place each time on the tune. And if you practice something like that, uh, it, breathing is something that comes naturally after a while. And I think the best way to show you a breathing example now is I'm going to play a couple of tunes with the band. I'm actually going to maybe continue on. I'm going to play you this tune and another one, and you'll see lots of breath control. So here's the tunes with the band. And there we heard a couple of reels with the band. Now, sometimes I've been playing with the band in different keys and different whistles to the actual whistle I've been using here. And the whistle I've been using here is a D whistle. And once again, I will say for younger kids, please use an F or a G. Now, this time I'm going to go on to slow airs. And I'm going to go on to some techniques that you need to know in order to play slow airs. And one very important one is vibrato which is done like this. And this particular one here is vibrato on your G note. And I'll do it for you once more. And this is vibrato on your F sharp. Vibrato on your A note. And on your B note. which sometimes on the B note it's better to use this finger because this one tends to screech the whistle. Now some of the hardest vibrato is on your D, on the bottom D, which is done with your throat, which is more like classical players would use, flute players especially, clarinet players would use a vibrato like this. And one more thing that's used in slow airs are slides which is sliding your finger off the note of the whistle. 
of the A nose, of the G nose, of any nose that you can possibly do it. And I'll show you how that's done. And normally you can slide in to a vibrato. And I think the best way to show you is actually play you a slow air. And this is a beautiful Irish slow air called the Cooler. And that is the very first part of the tune, that is the A part of the tune. I'm now going to play the B part. And that was the slow air called the Coolin. I think it's time again to hear that slow air with some accompaniment. <laughs> Thank you. 
And there we had the Coolin played with the band. Now, one more thing I want to do here before I leave you is teach you as many techniques as I can. And one of the techniques that are used very commonly on the whistle are piping techniques because they actually suit the instrument because a chanter, a piping chanter or an illin pipe chanter is very, very similar to a tin whistle except it has one or two extra holes. So some of the piping techniques are actually possible to use on the whistle. And they're what's known as crans and they're played like with your these three fingers here. And I'm going to try and, at the moment now to incorporate those into a tune. And you can see how these crowns actually help you to create rhythm and actually help you to stay on one note for quite a long time. And I'll just show you how they're done again. And that, that particular crown I showed you there was in D, which is probably the most common one. And I'll, leave, I'll just leave you with this one. So how you do it is you blow the note first, then. So it's one, two, three in rotation. Or you can swap the fingers around and get more rhythm from them by doing this. Now, one other piping technique that is very, very commonly used on the whistle are hammer-ons. Now, what I, what I explain a hammer-on as being something that you, it's like your, your finger flops onto a note. Like your finger falls on a note, but it actually bounces from once it reaches its source. So I'll try and do these for you individually first. And with those hammer-ons, I'm actually using my tongue again. I'm tonguing as well as every time I hit the whistle, I, my tongue is actually working in time with the hammer-on. Now what I'm going to do here is I'm going to play you a part of a jig that those hammer-ons are very, very effective in. It's a piping jig played on the whistle. These, again, are very effective for rhythm. Now, one thing I would like to go back to before we finish here is rolls, because rolls, again, are very, very important for playing reels and jigs. So I'm going to start at the bottom of the whistle and do rolls for you once more. Now, with that, there are lots of other exercises that you can do on the whistle. And one which is very, very good for your tonguing is triplets using your tongue, which are very, very difficult. And I would not recommend this for beginners for a while. If you want to practice it, you definitely can. But I don't think I'd recommend them for a while because they're very difficult. And I'm going to try and give you samples of these particular notes. So what I'm doing really is I'm playing a sort of a triplet using my tongue to emphasize the triplet and the rhythm of it. So they, are so they go something like this. Now, with all these techniques, if you practice these techniques individually, I would not recommend trying them all at once, but definitely practice them all individually. And you will find after a while 
that you can incorporate these techniques into the tune and they could become very, very natural. So all I can do at this moment is wish you all the best of luck with your lesson and hope that I have helped you in the best way I can. And I'm going to say good luck to you now and we're going to finish off with some tunes from the band. Thank you.